Join us for Focus on the Family Friday morning at 9 on the Soul of the City, AM 1000, WCCD. Welcome back to Summer Nights on WCCD, the Soul of the City. Hey, if you want to get on the air, give us a call at one 281 1110 That's one 281 1110 Give us a call and uh, voice your comment, okay? You're listening to Grace Cafe, a ministry that is rising in the Cleveland area with some good words. So let's go right now back to Denise. Well, right about now, I'm sitting here thinking, uh, I want to know what Satan's part is. You want to know what Satan's part is? Mm-hmm. Um, let me think now. Or oh, he's the intermediary. That's just that's what Charlie said before we... I think, oh, 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 wait a minute. Uh-oh, it's time once again for the comment corner. Surprise. Here a back booth and a hot brew here at Grace Calf. Take it away. Uh, yeah, Ecclesiastes one thirteen. That's the verse we talked about that... Uh, uh, it is experience of evil God has given humanity to humble them. It works. It works. It works for me every day. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6.34, Sufficient unto the day is the evil. It's the little things you see the day. The little things eat you alive. You know, you can rise to the occasion if you have some major disaster, but these little things tear you up. I mean, for instance, me, I got these dental problems. Before I go to bed every night, I can't just start brushing my teeth. No, no. I got to take a little pick. You see that little face between my teeth, Charlie? Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. I got a bridge there, and uh, my, my dentist says that unless I, I get down there and clean, you see, it's it's going to... It's gonna that grow. Bridge is it's gonna grow back to Yeah, I know. I can't understand what happened. I mean, I I used Crest as a kid. I think uh, I think my mom. You know, my mom raised my sister and me on Kool Aid, Captain Crunch, Oreos, Ho Hos, Coca Cola, and Pop Tarts. I know she was trying to do her best for us. I, I know that, but I mean, when we found out sugar caused cavities in my house, that was a major revelation. I mean, naturally, we we bought an electric toothbrush. But anyway, my dentist told me that if I don't get this brush in there, I'm gonna get this bacteria. Hey, this is terrible, right? So what's a big Hassle, you see? Oh, um, humiliating. It, it's an evil. It's an evil. It's an evil. My dentist says, you, you realize what, what the, the enemy is we're, that, that we're dealing with, don't I? I said, uh, I said, yeah, I said, the enemy's Oreos, right? And no, he said, the enemy's bacteria. So again, I'm going in there all the time cleaning this thing out. So apparently, this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. But that's not all I have to do. No, I still can't brush my teeth. More evil's coming. Now I have to floss. I have to floss every night. The hygienist, you know those ladies that stand there? She's the one that, sh- that demonstrated uh, the flossing, okay? She snapped on these latex gloves. She withdrew three football fields worth of floss, whacked it off, and stu- she stuck w- both her hands into my mouth at the same time. How do they do that? They stuck both her hands, right? I- I- I'm going to pick up- I'm gonna have to pick up the pieces. Huh? I-, I don't understand. I don't understand how they do that. Anyway... As soon as they get their, their hands in there, they start asking about all the vacations you took, right? So, where'd you vacation? Oh, I, 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 yeah. There was so much food on her, they, they wear these face masks, you know, when they're working on you, like it's some disease. There was so much food on her face mask after she flossed me, I asked for a doggy bag. <laughs> I mean, I still can't brush my teeth because then I have to, I have to rinse. I have to gargle. She told me I have to use Listerine. And I, apparently she thinks everybody can afford name brand uh, mouthwash. I can't. I, I, I can't. So I had to go find a Listerine substitute. I found it. I went to Kmart. Okay, they got this off brand. It's called American Fair Antiseptic Mouth Rinse. I'm telling you, but it says compare to active ingredients of Listerine. So I had to go through all this evil. I had to compare these ingredients, and they're all the same. It's amazing. Thymol, eucalyptol, menthol, salicyclate, menthol 0.042, water, alcohol, sorbitol solution, polyaxmer, benzoic acid, sodium saccharin, and yellow number 10. <laughs> so I got a rinse, and all this stuff I have to do every single night, it's an evil, but I'm kissable. Why, when I'm done, I'm kissable, right? I mean, and what, what happened? I go into my bedroom after all this labor, and my wife... I gotta pick up the pieces. I gotta pick up the pieces. <laughs> 
It's a half it, evil. It's an evil, and it humbles you. It, it humbles how you. How many Twinkies did you eat? Yeah, today? I ate them every came before I came today. You know what? He went to the Twinkie factory where they produce <laughs> Twinkies. I got Twinkies on the brain. I'm sorry. Hey, we have a caller. Good, deliver me. Hey, wondering. hi, Kurt. We're glad you waited. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Uh, welcome to Grace Cafe. Well, thank you. How's everybody tonight? <laughs> We're pretty loose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting hungry. You guys all sound pretty good on the radio. Well, thank you. Uh, Talking about evil here, yeah. and uh, I think you've stated your case pretty well uh, as far as that God causes evil. But if he causes evil, then is he responsible for the the shock waves that uh, come down with that evil as far as uh, man being cursed to die and then, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean... If you're going to make God the causer of evil, does that make him culpable for all the bad things that go on? Well, that's that, that's a that's a good question. It's a hard question, but I think we mentioned before the break about cause and effect. Um, if God is the cause, and if we've determined that uh, from Isaiah 45:7, then He would have to be responsible for whatever came from that you see whatever came down the line after it's like the illustration i gave of 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 the guy with the gun well i didn't shoot him your honor the the bullet did it i just pulled the trigger well that might be a bad example but uh it's a cause and effect so the way i understand it if uh, god starts the domino if god if god pushes down that first domino then he's responsible for the last one that falls does that make sense it makes sense but you know you wonder how does at least when you understand the traditional way that <clears throat> mankind is responsible for his own sin and all that sort of thing, that at least when they turn to God, then you can understand how God could receive glory from that because here's this thing that he created. He gave it a uh, you know motor of his own, and according to this person's own accord, for lack of a better word, all of a sudden he finds the good in God, and God reigns with him happily ever after. If God's causing this stuff to happen, how does he get glory out of that? Well, I think you said it yourself. Uh, He gets glory by uh, returning his creation to him because of what they've learned. They've learned so much more about God through going through the the evil. Remember, uh, were you listening to us last night? No, I didn't get a chance to last night. I was glad to hear it tonight, though, from 7 o'clock on. Good. Well, we, we were talking about how uh, how uh, God God is, is resp- He brings it on. I just lost my train of thought. Charlie, jump in here. Yeah, uh, I, I was hoping I could jump in here yeah. a second. Kurt, uh, I would have to ask you one question from the words, some of the words that you spoke there. Could you possibly go back to your to the Scriptures and look throughout the whole Scriptures and find me one passage where man is held responsible. Yeah, okay, that's responsible. it. Responsible. I'm not saying accountable. They're two different things. But find one where man is held responsible. Well, in Romans it says, and why is he still blaming? In other words, you know, he's talking about God uh, leaving the blame on man. I guess that would make him responsible, wouldn't it? No. Well, no, Charlie's right. Men are accountable, okay? The Scripture says we shall all give an account of ourselves before God. But none of us were at, well, none of us asked to be born into this uh, decaying world. None of us asked to be born into Adam. We are dying, which is, is an evil. We are dying of no, out of no participation on our part. We didn't ask for it. This has been forced on us from without. Therefore, we are not responsible for being dying creatures. Now, here's the shocking thing, and you were starting to talk about this, Kurt, but sin. Sin comes because we are dying. You see, we sin because we are mortal creatures, because we lack a full, in, a full measure of God's Spirit. So, uh, we're getting into some real sticky territory here, but uh, if we follow the dominoes, God's the one that made us mortal. Okay, well, I know the thing will go back to Adam. Somebody will say, well, Adam sinned. Well, who was behind that? Well, somebody will say Satan was. Well, who's behind Satan? We did this last night. We traced it back and said that there's a big sign on God's desk that yeah, says the, the buck, buck, stops, the buck here. stops here. Right, so I'm saying if God pushed the first domino, and we're seeing from Isaiah 45, verse 7, that he did, 
then he must be responsible for every domino that follows. And that includes evil and sin. But he didn't sin in doing that. But he's responsible. Otherwise, he's irresponsible. Anybody who's going to say God's not responsible for evil, they're going to have to start teaching the irresponsibility of God. But again, I want to make this point before we go, but that we are accountable to God. To give, you know, We are accountable. We, we give an account of ourselves, but uh, God's the one who's making the dominoes go. Yeah, I don't know how much time you have left there, but uh, you were talking about, uh, I guess, talking about losing your train of thought. No, I just did. That's yeah. okay. The oh, train well, of thought it. got derailed. You ought to be on this side <laughs> of the micro, of the phone lines, man. <laughs> Where's the... I tell you, I, I, I ride a thin... got help over there. <laughs> I ride a thin rail. It, that's true. I, I do have help. I have some capable help. Right. Where is that uh, passage? And I just had a brain fade that said, God subjects <laughs> all to... Vanity. Vanity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's Romans, a good one. It's right. Uh, Ro- Romans... 820. Oh, yeah. God subjected the creation to vanity, not willingly. Right? Romans 820. Yeah. Uh, let's go there. For the premonition, I'm in the concordant literal New Testament. Uh, the premonition of the creation is awaiting the unveiling of the sons of God. For to vanity was the creation subjected, not voluntarily. This is a scripture here, and this is what I was just talking about. We did not volunteer to be placed under this realm of of adam you got something to add to that yeah, well, well yeah I, this uh i think this is the answer to his question originally how can god get the glory uh from this evil that's been created and from the suffering uh let's back up to verse 18 uh, for i am reckoning that the sufferings of the current era do not deserve the glory about to be revealed for us now this is this is the glory about to be revealed for us. But let's continue where you were reading. For the premonition of the creation is awaiting the unveiling of the sons of God. For to vanity was the creation subjected, not voluntarily. We didn't ask to be uh, subjected to this, but, but we were. This is because of him who subjects it in expectation. Whose expectation? Is that our expectation? No. This is God's expectation that the creation itself also shall be freed from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So God will get the glory from this. It's his expectation. And, and what he expects, it will, it will come about. It's not just a, a flimsy hope of God. But right. this is part of the purpose. This is part of his expectation, part of his plan. And he will receive the glory from this. Let me, can I read that Romans 8.20 from the New Testament in modern English? Sure. Do I have time to do it? By J.B. Phillips. This is good here. This is J.B. Phillips' translation. It's a paraphrase, but the world of creation cannot as yet see reality, not because it chooses to be blind, but because in God's purpose it has been so limited. Isn't that good? Hmm. How's that sound? It sound good, yeah, Kurt. Yeah. Is Kurt still on? Yeah, I'm still All right. here. All right, but Ted, Ted was good to bring it back to your original point, which was the glory. Right. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I think it's you know it's, it's, you can see how you can pin the pin the blame on God and make Him responsible, but unless there's a way of bringing creation back to Himself and and restoring it or taking it for a further step, then you know, you wonder what the good of it is. Well, blame. Well, don't say blame. I mean, don't say we blame God for for creating evil. See, a lot of people would say would say blame, but no. It, when we see what is going to result from the introduction of evil into the universe, it will we'll see it as a credit. Right. We will be we praising God the for the wisdom, the wisdom He showed. This is beyond human wisdom. To bring in evil in order to make a foil, a backdrop for a display of his love. Then we'll say, we will praise God and credit God that we wouldn't know a Savior apart from sin and we wouldn't know good apart from evil. Right. Yeah, it's the contrast again. Nobody knows daylight until they've seen the night. Right. doesn't matter how much you think you can understand daylight. If you never saw it go dark, you would never love the sun coming up. Kurt, thanks for the call. Thanks okay. a lot, Kurt. Thanks Keep a lot, up the good work. God right. bless you all. All right, you too. You know, one thing I really loved here in, in bringing out Romans is that 
it says, in expectation, the creation. The creation. And does that yes. include man? I mean, <laughs> yeah. of course it does. See, the, the, yeah, but it, see, people have told me, I think it was these same scholars that uh, says Isaiah 45, 7 is permits, but they told me, well, the creation, that's just, you know, the trees and the birds. It doesn't include man. Oh, so, so God's going to reconcile porcupines and uh, lilac bushes, but not humanity. Hello? Is anyone out there in Radio Land? That doesn't make sense. Okay, all creation. You can't exclude oh. mankind from so sweeping and vast a word as creation, okay? You can't do it. But all that creation will be delivered. Yeah, that's an expectation, and it's God's yes. expectation. And ours, too. Who's at yeah, this? Well, here's, <laughs> here, here's the question I have. Who is in charge? Who is at the wheel? When left is wrong, who steers it right? Who is at the wheel? Is God? Listen to this song by For Him. That's a song for those of you who are on the road right oh, now. I used to play the drums. I can get into that. And then, People and used to pay me to do this. If you're falling asleep at the wheel, forget it, man. That song will wake you up. That's uh, For Him from the uh, CD Obvious. That's a good CD. I think what are we're you guys trying cracking to tell up about? who's at the wheel. What are you guys cracking up about? You guys getting slap happy at the end of the show here? Hey, I didn't lay a hand on it. I promised, I promised our listeners, and here we are, you know, we're in the last uh, seven minutes of our show, if that clock is to be, to be believed. And uh, I'll just do a little teaser here for tomorrow night, but we, we promised the folks we were going to show them that the word evil, which is raw, has no moral bias, and that's a key here to relaxing a little bit and i think when people hear this i'm not kidding you folks when you hear this you're going to relax a lot more uh, with the idea of god creating evil you're not going to be so uptight about it not that any of you are but this will you know this will make sure of it um so i got some time to get started on this and we'll hammer this tomorrow but hammer that's a that's a bad word we'll ease into it like we did last night you remember last <laughs> night buddy we eased i'm Maybe telling you wait Oh, yeah, I'm oh, here. Oh, oh, all right. I, 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 man, I've never been accused of putting anybody to sleep. Uh, the word raw, you remember what we did in the, the concordance when we traced the word, <laughs> when we traced the word bara throughout the scriptures and it was defined by its context, right? The context showed us that this word can't mean allows. Right. It's an act of creation. So evil, the same thing, the word ra. We can look at other passages of scripture that will prove, mind you, just like Galileo, I think he should have dropped those balls in the scientist's head. So these, I'm, I'm putting out this verse on Isaiah 45, 7, and I'm hoping out there that nobody is saying, oh, I, I'm just not going to believe that. I don't care what it says, I'm just not going to believe it. See, that's, a, that's bad. That, that, that's not good. So let's go to Genesis in the closing moments. Let's go to Genesis 37, 33. Genesis 37, 33. We have uh, Joseph, uh, his brothers threw him in the pit, and... Uh, his treacherous brothers uh, wanted to convince their father Jacob it was an accident, so they brought back Joseph's coat. So we don't know what happened. Here's his coat full of blood. Uh, let us know if this is your son's coat or not. Genesis 37, 33. And Jacob knew it was, and he said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. See, this context, I mean, let's ignore for a second that, uh, you know, Mo there was Jacob, some fraud. Yeah, let, let's ignore for a second the treachery of, of these sons and focus in on, on the word defining this word evil. What did evil mean to Jacob? Something that rent in pieces, and he described it, a beast as evil. Now, my question is, is a beast that, that he thought ate Joseph have any moral tinge? Can a lion be convicted of being a sinner? No, no. I mean, your poodle, your poodle Godzilla might very well chew your slippers, right? That's an evil. See, evil simply means to break in pieces. Oh, that That's all beast. it means. You might have a poodle named Godzilla that eats your slippers. So that dog has done an evil, but it has not sinned. All, it's doing only what its little poodle hardware told it to do. Chew slippers. You don't call the cops. You, you, you don't preach repentance to it. It didn't sin. It just did evil. It broke in contrast to a good animal. See, evil and good are in contrast to wrong and right. You see what I'm saying? A good beast, like a lamb, 
it doesn't tear things. A lion does. But neither one can be convicted of a moral wrongdoing. Right. You evil evil's not put in contrast to righteousness. Right. Evil is not righteous. It's just good. Good and evil. There's no moral tinge. I'm going to hammer that in. I'm, I'm, we're in the closing moments. Let me give you one more verse, and then we'll pick up with this tomorrow. Numbers 20. Numbers 20, verse 5. Israel grumbles against Moses and Aaron. They said, Why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? Now, this should hammer it home for you, folks. They called the desert evil. That's Numbers 20, verse 5. Remember, a word's context is going to give it away. It's going to give away its meaning. And here, the Israelites knew what evil was. It simply meant the land was broken down. There was no water there. There was, there was no plants, no nourishment. Okay? So they called it an evil land. Land can't sin. The land did not sin. The desert did not sin. So, you see, the scriptural connotation here, by looking at the divine context, how God inspired his writers to use this word. We're being detectives. We're looking at the context, and we're seeing, especially from this Numbers 20, verse 5, that uh, evil has no moral bias. It just means broken down. Right. And God must break in order to build. He must break in order to build. To show his ability. See? You can't fix something that ain't broken. And God breaks on purpose in order to show you how wonderful he is at fixing. You wouldn't know it unless the thing was broken. Are you getting it? Is it coming through? Don't be scared to associate God with evil because it has no moral tinge. We thank you for joining us at Grace Cafe. We'll be back tomorrow night to hammer down the rest of this section on evil. Stay tuned, stay with us, seek Christ. From Grace Cafe, to get in touch with Grace Cafe, you can send all your correspondence to P.O. Box 33345. I am going to talk to you about the fact that there are only three kinds of people in this world. This goes along with my message about there being two kinds of unbelievers. Tomorrow I'm going to tell you that there are only three kinds of people in the entire world. I'm going to follow up with my studies in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to do that uh, tomorrow. That's my plan anyway. But in light of yesterday's video with me lamenting over evil and my inability sometimes to get over it, realizing that Paul suffered unintermittent pain in his heart for his brethren according to flesh, Romans 9.2, I see no reason why we can't take Paul's being in nonstop pain because of his brothers according to flesh. Nonstop pain. That's what unintermittent means. It never stops. So it's an undercurrent in his life. He could be flying high in the spirit, but there's this nagging little undercurrent that he's never going to get on top of. Well, he might get on top of it, but he's never going to be rid of it. It's this undercurrent of pain for the unbelief in the world. And I think that that diagnoses my problem. And I combined that yesterday with the fact that all creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. Romans 8, 24 and 25. And Paul says, we ourselves groan within ourselves for the deliverance of our bodies. So... Paul had this operating on top of the pain that was already operating for his brothers according to the flesh. Now he's groaning for himself, and he's also part of the old creation. This is a three-fold groaning. I'm really expanding on it. I'm going to get to another topic today, but I'm really expanding on what I told you yesterday. It's a three-part groaning Paul has, and I'm going to apply it to you and to me. Paul groans, number one, for his relatives according to flesh. Number two, he groans in himself for the deliverance of his body. His body's dragging him down. His situation's dragging him down. Number three, he groans with all humanity. It's a corporate groaning. So apply this to yourself. You groan, uh, you're, you're in pain for your loved ones, your relatives who do not see this truth, who are either religious believers or worldly, uh, I'm sorry, who are either religious unbelievers or worldly unbelievers. Believers. And that causes you pain every day. And it's an undercurrent. It's just a little nagging thing, like a burr under the saddle. Never quite goes away. You can pretend it's not there. Drinking wine helps. Psst, psst. 
Um, but it always is. And it's not to say that you don't believe in God. It's not to say that your inward man isn't being renewed. It's just to say that here are the facts. So that's number one. Number two, you're, you're also groaning within yourself for the deliverance of your body. This is a more selfish groaning, but it's, it's there. I can't wait to get out of here, that kind of thing. I'm sorry. I'm no more noble than that. I'm not going to pretend to be. I can't wait to get out of here. My body's dragging me down. It takes work every day. Who knows how much part of every day we occupy ourselves just in maintaining these frames, just in trying to keep this flesh buggy going for another day in its decrepit state. It's work. It's ridiculous amount of work. By the time you're done brushing your teeth, putting on your deodorant, flossing, getting your hair fixed up, exercising, trying to eat right, uh, taking flax oil, uh, did I mention exercise? Attending to your body, spraying yourself with perfume to cover up the stench of mortality, all of these things. By the time you're done, you're lucky you have any time left to do your exercise your purpose in life. It's ridiculous. So we, we groan for ourselves. And the third groaning, apply this to yourself. I apply it to myself all the time. This is my dilemma. This is my, it's not a dilemma. It's a problem. It's a burden. Is that for the crushing weight of the evil that has fallen and befallen humanity? It kills me every day. Like Woody Allen said, the miserable and the horrible. So, there it is. Now, after that, I had some redeeming thoughts today, this morning. And I want to tell you about these because I am convinced, ladies and gentlemen, that every single thing we go through has been predetermined by God. Well, that's obvious right there already. Ecclesi uh, Ephesians 1.11, God is operating all things in accord with the counsel of his own will. We know that's true on a worldwide basis, but I'm speaking now individually. God is shaping you and preparing you for a role that you will have among the celestials. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 that somehow the celestials are going to be learning the multifarious wisdom of God through us, the ecclesia. Paul says in verse 8 of Ephesians uh, chapter 3, to me less than all the saint, less than the least, less than the least of all the saints was granted this grace to bring the evangel of the untraceable riches of Christ to the nations. That's us. And to enlighten all as to what is the administration of the secret which has been concealed from the eons in God who creates all that now may be made known to the sovereignties and the authorities among the celestials through the ecclesia, the multifarious wisdom of God in accord with the purpose of the eons which he makes in Christ Jesus. This opens the ceiling. We get a look into the celestial world and we find out that they are even now learning something of the grace of God in God's dealing with us. They see that God has taken the unwise, weak, ignoble, and stupid, and he is making something of us. And the, the, the celestial world, Paul says, we're a theater to messengers. He's talking about spiritual beings. We're a theater. I've told you before, this is like the Truman Show. They're watching us, and they're learning, and God's dealing with us. Do you think, or could, can you, would you even imagine that that would stop? That somehow, when we're glorified, and we're taken to our celestial home because our realm is not inherent here on earth. Our realm is inherent in the heavens. That's also in Philippians. Read the whole book. You'll find it. 2.10, 3.10. Our realm is inherent among the celestials. We are going there. And each of us, even if we don't rule or reign. I've heard some of you say, Martin, I don't care if I rule or reign. Those who suffer with Christ, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. Uh, those who suffer with Christ will be reigning with him also. But if we don't suffer with him, we won't be reigning with him, but we'll be saved, of course. We're saved by grace. It has nothing to do with suffering, nothing to do with works. Say, Martin, I don't care if I reign. I don't care if I rule. I'm tired. I just want to rest. String me up a hammock from the North Star to uh, to uh, Beetlejuice over here. I just want to rest for an, uh, for an eon before I do anything. I understand. I think you're going to feel differently when you're made immortal. Nevertheless, everything you go through today is preparing you for a role that you will hold in the oncoming eons. Because we know that it's um, giving you scripture after scripture. In the oncoming eons, not now, but in the oncoming eons, God is going to display the transcendent riches of his grace. And again, in his kindness to us. 
So he's doing it now, and he's going to be doing it then. Now he's showing the multifarious wisdom of God. Then he's going to be showing the transcendent riches of his grace in the eons to come. Each of us is going to have a role in that. It has nothing to do with ruling or reigning. You're going to have a role in that whether you're ruling or reigning or not. Now, every single thing you're going through today is grooming you for that. Nothing is wasted. Look at the life of King David. Everything he went through prepared him for the throne. He was raised a shepherd. It taught him discipline. He was responsible for the flocks. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, um, if you can't be responsible for a little thing, God's not going to give you a big thing. If a man's responsible for five cities, God will give him ten cities. I used to say that, you know, if you can't take care of your pets or your family, um, how are you going to take care of anything among the celestials? Well, Paul says that. One of the qualifications for a supervisor in the Ecclesia was that he ordered his family well. So, that gives you a hint right there. It should. Paul's saying, hey, we're going to look at what you do here on this earth and, and we're going to apply it to what you're doing in the celestials, in the bigger thing, when we come into the bigger thing, the bigger thing. So we complain and we gripe about, you know, take care of these bodies. I'm just stating the facts earlier. I'm not really, yeah, I guess I'm griping about it, about it a little bit, but I understand it. I understand it completely. These little things, the little things you have to take care of, whether you're taking care of your sick parents, whether you're watering a plant, whether you're feeding a cat or maybe 10 cats, uh, even taking care of your body, trying to go to bed on time. All these little disciplines are not in vain. They are preparing you for something. I'm not going to pretend I know what you're being prepared for. I don't even know specifically, you know, what I'm being prepared for. I know generally, but I don't know specifically. But I know that nothing is wasted. So God has orchestrated every detail of your life. Right? In Him, we are living and moving and are. Acts 17.28 he himself gives to all life and breath and all. Acts 17, 25, Jesus Christ said, Your very hairs are numbered. For anyone to say that God does not order the details of your life. A master's steps are ordered by the Lord. Proverbs 20, 24. Steps. Steps. You ever seen anybody get excited about a little kid's first steps? A two-year-old or one and a half, whatever. They they just stand up on their own. They're finally able to balance. And they take one tiny little ooh, step and everybody goes crazy. They throw confetti. They blow party horns. It's a big deal. That's ordered by God. Ordered by God. So, God chose your parents. God chose the country you were born in. God makes things happen to you that are absolutely essential. Here's the deal. God has this end game for you. He has this thing that you're coming into. Now, God knows the end from the beginning. He tells the end from the beginning. So he already has this place made ready for you, but he has to prepare you for it, you personally. He has to get you ready to do whatever you're going to do. And everybody's role in the celestials when we're transformed from mortals to immortals is different. Very particular role. So every single person has to be trained, has to be prepared for that. God wastes nothing. And so every single thing you're going through in your life is ordered. A master's steps are ordered by the Lord. Ordered for you to go through to prepare you. And I'm talking about when you fell down the steps and broke your leg. Uh, I'm talking about when you got a divorce. I'm talking about when you got sick or when your child died. All these things, God is like, God doesn't delight in bringing evil to you. Does not delight in it. But he's, he's like, he's, I, I got to do this. I got to do this. You know, uh, Hebrew says God didn't delight in the sacrifice of bulls and goats, but it was necessary to foreshadow the coming of Christ. Likewise, God does not delight to make you fall down the steps. I mean, I've often taunted God, though. I'll bang my head on the cupboard, and I would I'd look up to God because I know he's responsible, f responsible for it, and I said, you had to do that. That had to happen today. You, you really found that necessary that I should bang my head on that cupboard. And God's up there taking a deep breath. He's going, yes, yes, yes. That was absolutely necessary. There's no, there's no thing too small. If the hairs of our head are numbered, there's no pain, 
no inconvenience, too small that God says, ah, that was just window dressing. That was just a little flourish there. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, it does. It does. It means a lot. That thing is absolutely needed. Even that little thing, so let alone the big things, that was absolutely needed to fit you like a puzzle piece. You see, he makes the receptacle first, like the plate. You know, when you do a jigsaw puzzle and you have that little knobby thing that goes into the little holy thing, right? Well, God has the holy thing ready. You're the knobby thing, but he has to shape it just right or it won't fit perfectly. It's like a machined part. It's a, isn't it amazing how they take metal and they machine screws and they make a screw? It's just perfect. And you screw that thing in there and it goes right in there smoothly, smoothly, smoothly. Well, you are being fit for a role. And everything that's happening to you is necessary. It may seem redundant. It may seem ridiculous. It may seem gratuitous. Even superfluous. And I know for damn sure it's irritating. But you need, and I need, I'm telling myself this as I talk to you, to take a deep breath and realize you are being fitted. You are being fitted for a role among the Celestials that only you can fill. might not be a ruling and reigning role, but it'll be a role. Because every member of the body has a role. And Paul uses the human body as an example of that. <coughs> Excuse me. The foot, the hand, the mouth, the eyes, everything has a role. This today helps me to settle in a little bit better we still groan we're still in unintermittent pain but the beautiful thing is knowing that the groaning or the pain neither of these things are done in vain